Good morning, friends. Um, we are really pleased today on this spectacular sunny, sunny Halloween uh, to have Dr. Guy Naves, professor at religion at Luther College, uh, with us today. And he's also going to come back next week, which is a, um, um, a real bonus for us. Uh, I think you might have read uh, the information about what he's going to speak today, but uh, these next two um, Sundays, he's, uh, Dr. Nave is going to explore what biblical prophets consider God's will to be in response to earthly justices. Um, what is it that we think of God's work on earth, um, or heaven on earth would be? And I don't want to take up too much of this time, so I'm just going to introduce Dr. Nave, and maybe we'll have a few minutes for questions, but he'll be back next week. Thank you. Well, it is indeed a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be here in the past, and I've always enjoyed myself when I'm here. So I, I appreciate being invited back uh, and being able to spend this time with you uh, this morning. Um, again, as Nina said, um, I am a professor of religion at Luther College, and this morning, our plan is to spend a couple of weeks, so we got October 31st, this Sunday, and next Sunday, November the 7th, um, exploring the topic of reclaiming a prophetic voice, seeking justice in the face of injustice. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. is known for having said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Unfortunately, injustice is not something that's new. In this two-week series, I want to explore with you the relationship between biblical prophets and social justice. And I also want us to consider what a contemporary prophetic voice and vision might have to say in response to the many injustices in our world today. I'd like to begin with a simple question. When you think of biblical prophets, what do you think of? Um, I'd like a little bit of kind of interaction and engagement, if that's okay with folk here. Uh, very briefly, maybe if I get one or two responses. When you think of biblical prophets, what do you think of what comes to mind? Old men with beards. <laughs> Old men with beards. Angry guys taking it to the man. <laughs> Sitting and talking with people listening all around us. Ooh. All right. Other than what else? Uh, the false understanding of predicting the future. The false understanding of predicting the future. Um, excellent, excellent. This, this, this is a good segue, uh, that comment. Um, I want to explore a couple of misunderstandings of biblical problems, one of which falls uh, under there. But yeah, but, but this image, right? And, and, and I like Nina's comment about you know, sitting around in circles, kind of communal understanding of, of, of prophets. Um, um, I think it's, it's very significant in thinking about prophets. But a, top, a couple of common misunderstandings of biblical prophets uh, is, just as was mentioned there a moment ago, the kind of predictors of the future. You know, the kind of Nostradamus, these kind of folk who just see into the distant future and predict things that are going to come uh, in, in the near or distant future. And oftentimes that's the way that people tend to think. Um, also predictors of the Messiah, i.e. Jesus. Oftentimes when we're thinking of biblical prophets, we think of these people who foresaw and predicted the coming of Jesus. And we'll point to passages in the Hebrew Bible um, that suggest that these people were making predictions about something, an event that's going to happen four, five, six hundred years in the future. Uh, this understanding of prophets as the predictors of Jesus uh, is based primarily on a misunderstanding resulting from a practice known as prophecy historicized. Prophecy historicized. Prophecy historicized is this prediction fulfillment formula found primarily in the Gospel of Matthew. Right? And it involves taking prophetic passages 
out of their original ancient context and using them to comment on and generate historical narratives about later events that have happened. For example, using references from the Hebrew Bible, that's in the Old Testament, to generate narratives about Jesus' birth and death. Uh, the passage in Isaiah making reference to the birth of a virgin, right? And then we get into Matthew's Gospel. This was done in order to fulfill the prophecy, yada, yada, yada. So this idea of prediction fulfillment, again, which is strongly rooted in Matthew's Gospel, right? Um, or to embellish stories about Jesus' life. Um, an example, prophecy historicized. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take this child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. And here comes the infamous line. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Right? So, again, giving the impression that Jesus' escape into Egypt and being called back was predicted by the prophets as a whole. But if you go to the text that is being cited here in Matthew from the book of Hosea, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Mm. This passage is about the people of Israel in their time of slavery in Egypt. And Yahweh's love for Yahweh's people and calling them out of Egypt. And Yahweh identifying them as Yahweh's son. Right? The passage had nothing to do with Jesus. Right? Um, but the Gospel of Matthew does this, primarily the Gospel of Matthew, um, at least 14, 15 times. And it gives the impression that these biblical prophets are predictors of the Messiah. Right? And so, so they reach back, and this is not a, a criticism, right? I mean, but they reach back into their tradition to find texts that for them, apply and resonate to how they understand Jesus. Right? And so when they apply these texts to Jesus, again, giving the impression that in their original context, that is what their intent was. Right? But unfortunately, when we operate that way, we fail to really appreciate what the prophets were doing and saying in their time. Right? This is the question becomes, what were they about in their time? What was it that they were doing in their time? I think a more accurate understanding of biblical prophets is to understand them as addressing pressing issues and crises facing the people of their time. And if we, if, if we use the, what Enoch you know, described, right, you know, with the people, in the midst of the people, addressing the issues of their time. Right? Not looking 500, 600 years in the future, addressing the issues of their time. I, I, I often talk to my students uh, at Luther, and take a contemporary issue, right? Um, the high cost of tuition. <laughs> Something they can relate to, right? Uh, the amount of money that you, what kind of prophecy would get your attention? What kind of prophecy would be relevant to you about that particular issue, right? Uh, if I was going to say, thus saith the Lord, in the year 3010, college tuition will be absolutely free. Okay. What does it have to do with us living in 2020? Right? And the same is the case with these people addressing issues in 756 BCE, a promise about something that's going to happen 750 years from now doesn't really do a lot for the people. Right? And so to understand prophets as addressing 
issues of their time. Right? Prophecy served the role of addressing issues of the day by connecting communities with their God and helping them to discern the will of God, especially during times of social and what we might call political crises. In light of the role of biblical prophets, or in light of the role biblical prophets often play during periods of social and political crises, I think a more accurate description of prophets voices of radical social criticism, promoting social justice and an alternative social vision. And that latter half is important, right? Because oftentimes, we, you know, we, we talk about, I heard someone say, you know, these mad guys, they're mad. But it's not just about prophetic criticizing. It's also about prophetic energizing. That's to say, and this energizing takes place through the presentation of an alternative social vision. Right? It's not enough just to criticize what's happening. What's the alternative social vision to the way that things are? Right? We're all aware of how messed up things might be, but what's the alternative social vision? Right? And prophets were voices of radical social criticism promoting social justice and an alternative social vision. Speaking on behalf of God, biblical prophets often sought or often spoke out against social injustice. The prophet's outcry against social injustice was often motivated by a revelation and or understanding of what the prophet believed to be God's sense of justice. Biblical prophets had what they considered to be an experience of God, and they became gripped by an understanding of God as the one on the side of justice, the one opposed to injustice. And because they were gripped by this understanding of who God was, they were compelled and empowered by God to speak out against injustices and to speak on behalf of those who are often exploited and marginalized. The prophets often delivered a message directed against those in power. Speaking truth, speaking, bringing it to the man. Speaking truth to power. The prophets often delivered a message of critique against those in power and liberation on behalf of those oppressed by those in power. Biblical prophets not only spoke out against injustice, they also promoted, again, this alternative social vision. Their vision was a vision for this world, and I can't emphasize that enough. The vision was a vision for this world, not some far distant future non-earthly realm. Their concern was here, here in the here and now. And oftentimes, um, we'll often hear critiques of what some might call social Christianity, right? You know that that's that gets involved in too many earthly matters and, and what our concern should be is about the soul and about saving people and, and these kinds of things, right? Uh, and getting them ready for the other place, wherever they're going, right? Uh, uh, with, no real, with no real thought about this world. Uh, uh, a friend of mine um, has recently written a book, uh, My Kingdom is Not of This World coming from John's Gospel, where Jesus said, my kingdom was not of this world, and the world of this world, we would fight for it, and so on and so forth. Uh, and again, supporting this argument that our concern is not about here. Right? Our concern is about there, wherever there is. Right? Um, but biblical prophecy 
practice were concerned with promoting an alternative social vision for this world. This focus on promoting an alternative social vision for this world is most vividly depicted in Jesus' instruction to his disciples when he taught them how to pray. In the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus instructed his disciples to pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like the long line of prophets before him, Jesus not only spoke out against the injustices of his day by promoting an alternative social vision, he instructed his followers to seek and work for, with God's help, the establishment on earth of this alternative social vision. Earth is the realm for the establishment of God's kingdom. The establishment of God's will. And the question therefore becomes what does God's kingdom and God's will on earth look like? And I'm not going to pretend that in two Sunday sessions we're going to totally answer this question. <laughs> but in order to answer the question, we have to ask it. And as long as our attention is elsewhere, we'll never ask the question. I remember growing up as a kid, my grandmother always gave this warning, don't become so earthly, don't become so heavily bound that you're no earthly good. <laughs> don't become so heavily bound that you're no earthly good. Today and next Sunday we'll look at a couple of examples of biblical prophets and how they understood God's will. And today we'll begin with one of my favorites, the prophet Amos, who was one of Dr. King's famous, most favorite prophets. Whenever King is quoting scriptures, almost always some the book of Amos. Um, Amos prophesied around 786, between 786 and 748 BCE, during a period commonly referred to as the divided monarchy. According to the book of 1 Kings, somewhere around 920 BCE, a large contingency of people who comprised the kingdom of Israel sought relief from the forced labor and heavy taxation placed upon them by King Solomon. Social things, right? Heavy taxation, forced labor, so on and so forth, right? After Solomon's death, the people came to Solomon's son, King Rehoboam. And they said to King Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now for lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us, and we will serve you. Again, the concern is social issues, right? Taxation, exploitation, forced labor, yada, yada. Lighten this load, Rehoboam. And we will gladly serve. Rehoboam refused the request and told the people, Now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. This oppression and exploitation ultimately resulted in a mass uprising and revolt among the people. Right? 
You know, this is kind of like one of these responses of the 99% to the 1%, right? Being forced into heavy labor, exploiting the taxation structures, and the people were just saying, hey, give us a break, bro. Just give us a break. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel ended up rejecting the leadership of Rehoboam and the Davidic monarchy. In the Bible, the ten northern tribes that rejected the leadership of the Davidic monarchy become identified as Israel. And the two southern tribes that remain faithful to the Davidic monarchy become identified as Judah. So now in our Hebrew Bible, we have Israel and Judah. And we follow along in the Hebrew Bible, and it tells the story of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah and their conflicts with each other. Right? But this is what caused the United Monarchy to divide. Right? Like many biblical, well, now, again, just going back to the time frame. So, Amos is prophesying in 786, 748, a couple hundred years after the divide. During the reigns of King Uzziah in the south, Judah, and King Jeroboam II in the north, Israel. And according to the Bible, Amos was originally from Judah, but was called by Yahweh to go north in order to prophesy to Israel. <clears throat> Amos' message was one of criticism against Israel for the exploitation of the poor by the upper class. Which is interesting, right? Because the source of the divide, right, was the exploitation of the people. Right? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I'm dating myself. I got any who fans in here? Uh, but, um, but, but the cause, right, it causes them to split. It is what they ended up replicating. Which, unfortunately, is often the case, right? Like many biblical prophets, Amos delivered a message of social critique against political and religious leadership. He criticized both political and religious leadership, as well as the wealthy, for their unjust treatment of the poor and oppressed. While we often tend to spiritualize what it means to not follow God, much of the criticism delivered by biblical prophets for failing to follow God is actually criticism focused on unjust treatment of others. That's say, what does telling you to follow God look like? Often they think, oh, well, it looks like not reading your Bible, and it looks like not coming to church, and it looks like not praying, and it looks like these spiritual things, right? According to biblical prophets, not following God is reflected most vividly through unjust treatment of others. The mistreatment of poor and oppressed people was often the greatest demonstration of a failure to follow God. And throughout the Bible, prophets often spoke out against the exploitation of poor and marginalized people. Now, during the long reigns of King Uzziah in the south and King Jeroboam II in the north, both Israel and Judah lived in relative peace, experiencing no major military threats from ancient Near Eastern powerhouses like Egypt and Assyria. And it's, as is often the case, periods of relative peace are often accompanied by prosperity. Throughout history, these periods of peace usually are accompanied by periods of 
prosperity, at least prosperity for a few. And according to Amos, at the expense often of the many. It was the unequal distribution of the nation's goods and wealth that Amos condemned as abhorrent to Yahweh. The unequal distribution of the nation's goods and wealth. According to Amos, Yahweh would punish the wealthy for their treatment of the poor. Amos was one of the first biblical prophets to argue that social justice is as vital to religion as worship of Yahweh. I hope you heard me. Social justice is as vital, if not more so, to religion than worship of Yahweh. Yahweh, who demonstrated compassion by delivering Israel out of the slavery of Egypt, expected Israel to likewise demonstrate compassion. And Amos insisted that ethical behavior is more important than ritual observances. The word of Yahweh from Amos the prophet to the people. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. You know, these solemn assemblies we have, we gather together regularly in an assembly. Now we say, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of your well-being, of your fat animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. Our God is an awesome God! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melodies of your harps. Was the alternative, but that justice rolled down like waters, and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This is what I'm looking for. If we gather and sing and make offerings, and there's injustice everywhere outside. No, 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 no. But we have to make a choice. Take away the offerings, take away the singing, take away the solemn assemblies, take it all away. But the justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Yahweh, through the prophet Amos, is declaring. That justice is what Yahweh is concerned with. According to Amos, God desires justice far more than religious ritual observances. Amos' demand for social justice was direct and uncompromising. As is often the case, Amos' demand for justice on behalf of oppressed and marginalized people offended both the political and religious elite. Political and religious elite. Amos' words were so disturbing that the priest forbade him to speak and expelled him from the sanctuary. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, the house of God, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, now again, most the communication here, right? Between the priest and the king. So the religious and the political. 
together. Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go in, uh, into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Again, those relationships. The relationship between the temple and the state, the religious and the political. Right? The temple is the king's sanctuary. We'll talk a little bit later, if not today, but next week. I think about this relationship between church and state. Not the formal relationship, but the relationship that we have in practice. And how that relationship that we have in practice impacts and affects what we are willing to say to those in power. The critique that we're willing to offer to those in power because of the relationship. I'm running back to my wise grandmother again. Growing up as a kid, she always had things to say that I understood later as I got older. Right? But um, I didn't really understand then. But again, some of these relationships um, and she would say, son, be careful who you run around with. You lay down with dogs, you end up with fleas. <laughs> it's about relationships. Right? And who do we decide to have a relationship with here? The relationship, the sanctuary, and the king. The religious and the political. Right? And so, so both were upset at Amos. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees. And Yahweh took me from following the flock. And Yahweh said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from Israel. According to Amos, because of Israel's social injustice and religious arrogance, Yahweh would severely punish the people by causing the kingdom of Israel to be destroyed by the Assyrians. Needless to say, those in power and responsible for the oppression being condemned rejected Amos' message. So, what I like in the last, what do we have here, maybe 10, 15 minutes, is just some conversation about this notion of relationships right? and what impact, if any, does that have upon the sanctuary, the church, the establishment, to engage in a prophetic voice, right? I mean, does the prophetic voice have to come from outside of the religious establishment? Or is there a way from within the religious establishment to exercise the prophetic voice, right? And again, oftentimes, biblical prophets and again, we often associate them as kind of religious insiders. But in some way, they're 
really religious outsiders. Outsiders representing the will of God, which is an interesting dynamic. Right? Where should the will of God be represented from? And I'll make an argument that, you know, next week, that in many ways Jesus was a religious outsider. But remember a moment ago when I talked about that what caused the divide in the, in the kingdom? And then how the northern kingdom is rejecting their exploitation ends up replicating that. And so the, the question becomes how have possibly we as followers of Jesus who in his day is actually in many ways functioning as a religious outsider religious outsider in the context of the establishment right because he's rejected by both the Roman government and the temple leadership right He's arrested in the temple. Right? Charges that are brought by religious leaders and political officials. Right? And so he's in many ways standing outside of the establishment. And then over the course of time, the followers of Jesus become the establishment. And so the question is, are we able to reclaim the prophetic voice and allow the prophetic voice to operate with, from within the establishment? Or do we have to embrace the wise words of Audrey Lord from 1968, she talks about the inability to dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. I don't know, but this is what I would like, I think maybe for the last 10 minutes that we have together, to explore and to talk. I'd love to hear thoughts, reactions to present thus far to this question, this idea about reclaiming the prophetic voice. And again, we'll continue this next week as well, right? And we'll look at some other prophets. We'll look at Isaiah. And we'll look at Isaiah's message. And then we'll look more specifically at some contemporary things, like Black Lives Matter, other kinds of social movements. And where is the prophetic voice of the church in response to these social injustices? Yeah. Thank you so much. This was really thought-provoking. One question I have is, how do we square Amos 5, 21 to 24 with Psalm 100 and all the myriad of psalms that talk about praising God with the timbrel and harp? Mm -hmm. There it talks about the harp is apparent to, to God um, and singing to the Lord a new song and the, the role of music in the praise of God. And uh, mm -hmm. um, how, how do we square those two seemingly contradictory no, excellent, excellent, excellent question. Um, no one perspective is a unit, like a blanket. Uh, everything is contextual. Everything is contextual, right? So Amos is in a context. And he's in a context of social crisis. He's in a context of exploitation. He's in a context of marginalization. And within that context, Amos is... Yahweh, the voice of Yahweh is saying, you know, and it's not that, you know, I mean, on the drive up here from Deborah, you know, I'll listen to the crazy music all up in my car, right? You know, I'm singing in the car and having myself a good old time on the way up here, right? Uh, uh, but in the context of a world within which black and brown people are being shot down every day by police in a world where People are being marginalized with who they want to choose to live their life with and who they want to marry in a world where women are being paid significantly less. I mean, you know, in this world, in this context, 
It's not about the heart and the temple. Right? And so it's not an either or. Right? You have to make a choice between what we hear in Psalms and here. But it's just recognizing right, the part of this whole thing. Right? Again, in establishing and understanding what God's will is, is identifying in context of injustice, right? Going back to the title, in the face of injustice, what's the response? And that's kind of the way I, I read it, is that, that um, how can I, you know, be um, praising God through song and, you know, in worship or whatever the festival is, and at the same time turn a blind eye to all the things that are going on, or, or maybe even support some of those injustices, but then turn and praise God, is, is really maybe where more of is coming from. Not oh, very much so. <laughs> As a kid, I didn't grow up in church, but I have fond memories. <laughs> A fond memory, right, of all the churchgoers who would drive by. You know, you know, I, you know, I was a kid, you know, at the pool hall, hanging out, you know, with friends on the stoop. You know, we're sitting around playing cards, shooting dice, you know, drinking beer, whatever. Right, and on Sunday morning, and the cars would drive drive through our neighborhood to get to church to wherever it is they're going. Right, but they had to come through, you know. And there's always a deafening sound that to this day. It still just thumps in my ear. And it's the sound of electronic door locks. I mean, they vibrate in my head when I hear them. To this day, as a 56-year-old man, they still vibrate in my head. Uh, because, you know, we be doing things that I'm not even paying attention, right? You know, I was just sitting here, I was going to go, And it's like, man, really? So, you know, so, so then, like, we raise up to look to see what's, you know, this so many. I don't even think about you, right? You know, we're always just enjoying ourselves. You're on your way to church to praise God, and you're thumping and locking on your windows and doors. Right? It's just that sound, right? But again, but on your way to, you're not thinking about all the people that you're passing by who are homeless, who are whatever, wherever, right? It's not even entering in your mind. On your way to, Praise and worship. Right? It's like, there's just an inconsistency there with that. So my challenge is, what, how do you identify it in the present? You know, that, what you just explained. I grew up in the inner city of St. Paul, and, uh, you know, you went past, uh, if you were going down to Dale Street in St. Paul, you, you locked your doors, right? <laughs> At least the us privileged did. Mm. And uh, so, how do you identify? I, because I became a part of that. Mm. I was the one that was privileged, and, and I was afraid of losing my, you know. You know. So how do you how do you recognize that in the present? Mm. You, know, you know, music actually I think brings you into a realm of common realm. Mm. But, uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Let's ask a question, and, and, and from, from what I hear, again, I don't know a lot, but you know, in your food ministry, it just sounds as though you open table, you know, that you all go to the neighborhoods and maybe you lock your doors. I don't know, you know, that you. But is, is this is this one is recognition, right? One is recognition, and two, just really thinking about. I mean. You know, you come through and lock the doors, and, and again, and we'll look at when we get to Isaac, right? There's probably more marginalized and oppressed people who are robbed. <laughs> robbed by the system to which I can't lock a door to. Right? You know, the daily pilfering and robbing is taking place. I have no electronic door lock that I can push to keep you out of my pockets, right? And so we're being robbed and pilfered daily, right? But again, but it's, it's just really about kind of just taking the risk to explore and to, and to reflect upon, right, um, these things, right? That's the beginning, I think. 
Uh, one thing that I find helpful is just the basic principle that if you reduce everything in Scripture to the will uh, of the will of God to one thing, which Jesus was asked, was love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, your neighbors, your yourself. The difficulties happen when we try to separate the two. Mm -hmm. We make it either ethics or we make it um, uh, uh, God. And, and I think that's a lot of times where some of the problems, but I guess what I wanted to comment was the enormous complexity. Uh, I've, I've been uh, in a position where I, we did try to speak, we do try to speak. Mm -hmm. What's always fascinating about that and what complicates it, I think, especially in this day and age, is that um, when we speak, we tend to import the ideology and the language of, of, of secular theories and don't use biblical language, which is our common language. So we're seeing this incredible polarity where uh, in some circles, all you have to do is mention the word justice and the person from um, the right immediately thinks of university professors that are pushing a certain ideology. I'm serious, I'm serious. And, 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 and then you say the other one, it's the other. And, and so I think one of the one of the concerns, even within the church, is the lack of understanding that, that the social is, in fact, deeply important. But then how do you maintain that commitment so that it is frequent? Because se senators and people will tell me, we don't very often get a call from a Christian saying, I wish you'd pay attention to this. We just don't. It's usually somebody that just is advocating in a very, very persuasive way for something that will leverage their interests. Yeah. And, and so I think it's, it's not really even on the awareness. So, so I'm wondering if that's one of the first things, is, is actually this branching out so people understand it more clearly, that it, it, it is. Because Glenn Beck got away with saying, if you ever come across the word justice yeah. in connection with Christian, know that it has nothing to do with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Which was one of the most amazing statements you could possibly make. And yet, right. there were a ton of people that thought he was right. Exactly. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very much so. I know a lot of people have questions. Trying to take it in the order. And if you're we'll be continuing this next I'm week. I'm going to let it <laughs> We sang that today. And I think that what the prophet's talking about is what are you using your music for? Are you using it for justice or injustice? When you sing the Pledge of Allegiance, when you say the Pledge of Allegiance, are you sing the national anthem at a football game and somebody takes a knee? You know, calling for justice, aren't they? Mm -hmm, very much so. And sometimes people that sing the national anthem are doing that too, but sometimes they're calling to ignore justice. So when I look at what's a long, complex history over 2,500 years of, of this going on, I think. Uh, simplistically that we've gone from a grassroots to trying to build ourselves more than that and we lose sight of our mission and you know it really often comes and you we replicate this over and over and over and over as we can see through history where we start out with a good intention and then we build a system much like what we didn't like and so it, it all kind of comes back if you can define your mission and stick to your mission, remember your mission. You know, you can maybe prevent that a few more years than, than yeah. history seems to show. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Right, and, and, and I think I think I might right. And, and I think I think it's rooted in again a willingness to continually be changing. Right. I mean, you know, I'm always amazed, and people say it like it's a badge of honor. Right. Um, Oh, you know, what I believe, I, I believe this for 40 years. I, I, you know, this is what I, you know, this is my, I, as though believing the same thing. You know, my daughter's 20 years old, to turn 21 this year. 
And she said, you know, I believe at 21 when I believed when I was six. I was like, baby, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. <laughs> right? Um, but for some reason in, in our in religion, we, we think we take that as a badge of honor, right? You know, look, right? And we're not willing to constantly be flexible and constantly be changing and con constantly be evolving, right? And, and that's, I think, why we end up replicating, right? Because we start out as a change movement but we lose the willingness to continually change, right? And the thing is we have to be willing to constantly be changing. It's not just change and then become. It's change is it. Ch change is it. It's are we willing to consist, continually be that, right? And I think that's... So, for, uh, this is who I'm looking to go to the next week, but... So Constantine decides it's politically <laughs> advantageous yeah, to Constantine. let the Christians uh, hang out and then make it the state religion. And most of us arise from European extraction where the church was co-opted by the state for centuries and enjoyed many benefits mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. So is the, has the church been harmed more gravely by this partnership with the government? Uh, than it has gained. In the sermon this morning, we heard how in China growth has been better uh, when it was when Christianity was banned than it is where it is now uh, blessed by the government, more or less. And I think we see uh, at the moment uh, a worry about our future uh, as far as uh, numbers in the mainstream churches. And to what extent is that related to our relationship to the government? Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, actually. yeah, I do think we'll probably be talking about that next week. Yeah, but it's Constantinian Judaism, Constantinian Christianity, constant. Yes, you know, when, when, when religion and empire become one, then it becomes something. Have you all been to church yet? Yeah. All of you? If you need to go, go. <laughs> I think I'm going to go up and join the church this morning. Yeah, I think I'm going to go up and... I just get excited to think, let's have more conversations. Spur, spur this on, guys. This is awesome. And you know what? We are Christian. Why can we not gather with other Christians to realize that we have the same message? God is love. I mean, you know, let's spread this. How do we do this? I mean... We don't get along with, with our Lutheran sins, much less, you know, the other Christians. This is awful. I think we need to tell you this. Before they do speak, because Pastor Martha just said, I don't know. Well, again, we, God willing, we'll be back here again.